All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. All right, welcome to the KISS FAQ podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. I did not say a number because I have no idea what number episode this will be. Uh, But today I've got two very special guests with me. First and foremost, who should go first? I think John Jeffrey, uh, who portrays Ace Frehley in the KISS This Upstate New York. Can I say upstate for you, please? Or am I going to get savaged? You can, although... I, because there are a couple other Kiss This tribute bands around the world, we say Kiss This WNY for Western New York. So that's how we differentiate ourselves for people that may get us confused with another Kiss This. So you're, you're getting to see John Jeffrey unmasked today. So um, there, there you go. It's something unusual. <laughs> He's got very good taste in box sets behind him. I'm very happy with that creature's box. Um, David Julian. For people who don't know who you are, why don't you introduce yourself and just give everyone a a quick pricey to your uh, professional life outside of the Buffalo Rock City tribute that we'll be talking about today. Yeah, Dave Julian, uh, toured around in some bands. I was actually on a label, signed uh, signed to a label owned by uh, Robbie Tickek of the Goo Goo Dolls. Uh, It was about 15 years ago, and since then I've been just doing writing and and in the last five years, focusing on rock writing, I've worked with uh, some folks at the Frontiers label. And my latest thing is, uh, you know, I've got a, a co-write coming up on the Ace Freely record that's coming out. Yeah, and that, that's a very cool topical thing. You know, Ace today, uh, for people who are watching this episode now, you can check out the FAQ. Ace has been talking about that new album, which he has now given the title 10,000 Vaults. And he's, uh, you know, giving a couple hints about what's coming and what's going to be happening, a single coming out soon. Now that's record label um, is going to decide the timing. And then the release, I think he's aiming for February of 2024. But again, record labels make the the timelines but he has handed in the record um according to what he had to say which is a big big win for kiss fans who are waiting for new music now talking about new music we are here today to talk about buffalo rock city volume two first and foremost john congratulations thank you because you you did this a few years ago buffalo Mm -hmm. rock city volume one which was dedicated to your brother yes and you immediately did um some charity work with the proceeds for that album and you've carried that over into buffalo rock city too but first question up is why have you decided to go through all that again it can't have been easy the first time around and here you are you know i think like anything when you go through something um like doing the first buffalo rock city album it's a learning experience and when you look back at it you kind of you know look at it and try to figure out things you could have done differently perhaps better and so you kind of want to i guess you know create a learning curve for yourself and that's pretty much what i did so and it just kind of seemed inevitable after doing the first one like literally as we finished the first one I had, you know, some of the guys who were were on it saying, so when do we start the next one? And and in reality, I really wasn't thinking about it. But then, you know, after it it came out and, you know, there was a lot of positive uh, feedback from it. It just it just seemed inevitable that a second one was going to happen. So, you know, so I went uh, headfirst into doing the second record. I think it's important at the top of the show to talk about the Maria Love Convalescent Fund. Why is that important to you? Uh, Truthfully, it's an organization that um, my mom, um, like you mentioned, she had passed away actually right after the first album was released in January of 2021, uh, January 20th. As people know, that's also Paul Stanley's birthday. So that was a very 
you know, kind of, you know, bittersweet thing as, as a fan to have, you know, that happen. Um, she actually was the one who discovered the organization to help my brother um, who was disabled. And one of the things that they did is they helped my brother get a, a orthopedic bed, uh, a mattress, because he had uh, back issues and they were able to actually uh, help him with that. And so when I was thinking about another charity to work with for uh, Buffalo Rock City 2, um, that just came to my mind that I felt like that would be a great organization to give back to. And um, so that's that's why I decided to work with them. And upon making that decision, I did even more research into the organization and the founder who the organization is named after Mariah Love herself. She was uh, very ahead of her time. She went to Paris in the late 1800s and she saw how they utilized the, the nanny system there. And she applied that, um, here in the United States, when she came back to the States, she opened up the very first daycare in the United States, um, right here in Buffalo, New York. So that, that was pretty neat to find out that the, the very first daycare was actually started here and she was the one who founded it. And again, it was from, uh, seeing how the, you know, the nanny system worked for people over in Paris. So that was, that was pretty cool. So, so far with Buffalo Rock City, there have been a couple of teasers. You've done a fantastic video for Calling Dr. Love, um, which is, I'm sorry, that was super fun. I know it had people bickering as usual as anything will do. And you've also had a CD single for the mighty Jean Beauvoir. And David, you mixed this song. So how did you become involved in the Buffalo Rock City 2 project? And uh, just talk a little bit about who wants to be lonely with John. Yeah, so <clears throat> I actually met John Jeffrey. We were both in line to see Ace Frehley uh, backstage after a recent show. I, I had never met him before, and because I, I got a chance to work on the record, I um, you know was backstage to meet him. This guy behind me, we start talking, and then all of a sudden, you know, he was talking about the project, the, the first one. And um, then, uh, you know, we kind of kept in touch. And then, uh, I don't know, what was it, probably a month or two later, uh, he called and said, hey, do you want to mix a few songs? And he had heard some of my material and said, hey, I'd like to have you mix a few things. And and I said, sure. I mean, it's a great cause, and I really like the project. And and I remember Jean Beauvoir pretty well from back in the day. And I know that he co-wrote that song and I always liked it. So, you know, it seemed like a good fit. Yeah. One of the three MC videos that made me a fan of the band. So I'm all in with that artwork. Uh, but yeah. I want to be educational here for everyone as well. What does someone who mixes a song do? Uh, just explain in 90 words or less your your role. Yeah, you could go on for a while on this. Now, yeah. mixing is basically just you're taking the instruments that are recorded, you're EQing them and placing them, balancing them, making everything sound better. So you're just kind of putting the polish on what's already been recorded, essentially. Okay, so that's a, that's a great 20,000 foot view. And, and seriously, that's 20, 000, that's like 80,000 foot view of what you do, because there's a lot more alchemy that goes into it than just that, isn't there? Um, why did this turn into a CD single? I'm very curious about that, because it's a great little sampler as well of the previous um, volume, John. Well, basically what we wanted to do is, of course, we wanted to try to get the buzz going for the record. Um, we actually started recording the album back in July of 2021. And um, the great thing was that we were able to get literally more than double the amount of national worldwide, you know, celebrity guests. We had six on the first record and we wound up getting 13 on, on two to appear on the record. But when we did the first record, it was right in the middle of COVID. So that actually worked in our favor in that all these people who were planning on going out and going on tour and, you know, being busy, they wound up being stuck at home with nothing to do. So I was able to kind of take advantage of that to get the people to record their parts at the time. But when we started recording two, 
you know, the, the COVID restrictions and everything started to lift and people were managing to live life again, you know. And um, so for some of the, the celebrity people who committed to being on the record, although they committed, it took a very long time in some cases to get their tracks. So we actually, in between volume one and volume two, we released a live CD um, again, the purpose of that was essentially to keep the, you know, the brand name, the Buffalo Arc City name out there, you know, so people wouldn't forget. And um, so we put that out in 2022. And again, it just, it, it was taking a long, it's me, I'm very impatient. It was taking a long time for the, for the record to finish. So I wanted to do something to kind of, you know, get the buzz out there about the record. And um I was speaking to Jean and he was telling me that he had this um, this Kiss Expo that he was doing for the Kiss Lounge down in Mexico. And if people aren't familiar with the Kiss Lounge, it's basically like a uh, Kiss Museum, an, an unofficial one. But I know that the band, they um, they acknowledge it, even though it's unofficial. And um, they were celebrating their 20 year anniversary and Jean was the special guest for I believe it was Friday and Saturday that they were celebrating uh, the anniversary so I, I know that Jean had put out his his book recently but I don't believe he had any new music that he was going to have when he was going down there so I had the idea of releasing who wants to be lonely as a CD single along with three tracks from the first Buffalo Rock City record that kind of tied into his, you know, kiss connection. And so um, he kind of contacted me last minute, deciding that he wanted to go ahead with the CD single. And I literally had, I believe it was from Friday to Wednesday to get the song mixed and have the artwork created and then to have it mastered and have it sent off to be pressed. And that's when uh, I, I was already talking to David Julian about, you know, working on some of the songs on, on the record. But that was kind of like a thing. I was like, hey, David, um, do you think we could switch gears instead of you working on this song, work on this song and like get it done like now? <laughs> and he did. So that that's... Uh, you got it done, and it's nice design aesthetic. Uh, again, David, how do you, how do you approach you know mixing a tribute song? Do you go back and listen to the original uh, for a reference point, or do you have, um, or do you work in collaboration with the artist for what they hear in their head? Well, you know, John had a lot of input on the mixes, which was great, and I listened to the original one. And quite honestly, a lot of times you're kind of beholden to what's recorded, right? So. If there's something that's missing from or different than the original, you know, you kind of have to work within those parameters. And in this case, a lot of what was there was kind of reminded me of the original. So that's kind of the direction that we went in. Um, you know, sometimes people want to hear a totally different version. Sometimes they want to hear something similar but updated. And I feel that's kind of what we did is kind of the latter of the two. And I just... I thought his vocals on it were just great. That was the big thing for me is in mixing that song, I was really inspired by the vocal because he's such a good singer, you know, and, and I know he co-wrote the song with Paul and I know he, you know, I remember seeing him, you know, sing and I knew how great he was, but when you hear the, the, the raw vocal of just him singing, I mean, it's, it was really great. Is that how you, you approach tracks? Do you lock in on, you know, an instrument? It's this this is an element that's really catching my ear on this particular song, and that kind of becomes a guide? Yeah, that, I mean, you always want the vocal to be out front, obviously, but in this case, you know, if somebody's not as strong vocally, you might tend to sit them in the mix a little bit, but his vocals were so great, they needed to be front and center, and, you know, uh, I mean, everything on that song was so well recorded that it was kind of easy to do, but his vocal is really obviously the forefront of that because he's such a good singer. Yeah, I can kick out and, and start asking all sorts of technical questions that I won't even ask properly. Just <laughs> I, find, I find it fascinating, uh, just the whole process of creating art in this manner. Um, John, what were the first songs that you decided were going to be on this album? And did you already have ideas about the artists that you wanted to be working with or how you wanted to approach uh, volume two? Well, it's, it's kind of funny the way that it happened because, um, again, after doing volume one, 
you know, I, I did a lot of press for it and um, <laughs> I didn't realize it, but I kind of was like creating sound bites with my interviews that I, I, I kept repeating myself saying that uh, Buffalo Rock City One was the non cock rock kiss tribute record. And so my friends who were on the record, you know, they would they would bust my balls and say, oh, you, you, you saying that. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, it just it just makes sense. So I, I did, you know, and it's funny because people will always give, you know, Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons shit for, you know, using sound bites. And, and now I kind of understand why. You know, if you're being asked the same question and you give an answer that makes sense, it just makes it easier just to kind of give the same answer because it makes sense, right? So going into making the second record, I'm like, well, if Buffalo Rock City is going to be the non-Cock Rock Kiss tribute record, <laughs> then I guess Buffalo Rock City 2 is going to be the Cock Rock Kiss tribute record. And when I started thinking about that, I started looking at, song titles and the funny thing is i never realized how many songs literally have the word love in them so that was my initial thing is i was going to try to get like literally every single kiss song that had the word love in there and and i and i couldn't get enough so i had to go then with okay well what about songs that they would have love in the chorus but not in title or there would be some sort some way about love in some way or shape or form um and then ironically after coming up with a with a you know a pretty lengthy set list i was also noticing that a lot of the songs that i picked had a, had a, another um theme that was going along with them was that most of the songs were songs that originally featured ghost players on there. For example, I, as you know, had uh, Alan Schwartzberg playing drums instead of Eric Carr. Uh, you know, Vinnie Vincent was Vincent Cusano at the time, ghost playing on Creatures of the Night. Bob Kulik was playing guitar on Killers. Uh, Kevin Valentine played drums on You Love Me to Hate You. Um, so, you know, it was funny that there was like this kind of dual thing happening with the, um, with the, with the, you know, the, the song list for the record. So it just kind of all fell into play like that. I love that. I love, I love when there's some underlying theme that's not completely obvious. And of course, Rick Derringer on Exciter. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's go on. So let's talk about some of the songs. Uh, so, David, you you uh, mixed quite a few songs. I want to jump in with one of my favorite vocalists of all time and one of the people who have given me some of the funniest stories that I get to retell, John Karabi, Down <laughs> on Your Knees, which is, of course, a Bruce Kulick uh, connection. I, I'm just absolutely blown away by this album and how everything sounds powerful. Everything sounds dynamic. And since listening to it, it's been on repeat continuously. Uh, so oh, it's, pa Thank it's, you. it's past my test. Um, talk a little bit about mixing a song like Down on Your Knees that has that Bon Scott swagger and John Karabi's, uh, you know, gravelly voice. I mean, uh, is that what you're locking into there? Yeah, that one was actually a little bit tougher um, because John's got a very distinctive voice. So the music has to kind of support that. And I, at first I was... Kind of having a little trouble with it but you know I, I probably was trying like probably overthinking it and then i just said you know what this is just this is a rock tune and i actually it's funny you mentioned the kind of the bond scott gravelly thing because while i was mixing i went back and listened to some you know like highway to hell and some of the <laughs> earlier acdc stuff and i was just like you know that stuff is just so powerful and it's so great and i kind of drew on that you know upon that when i was kind of mixing so for me it was just like okay well how do the greats do it? And let me just try to, if I could even get like a percentage of that, you know, and just try to get close to that, you know, and, and, you know, and try to make the mix sound like a, you know, like a mutt laying highway to hell thing or something, you know what I mean? It would be great. So that's kind of what I, you know, what I referenced, you know. And it really comes across because that's one of the songs that a, a lot of fans kind of bag on as one of the weaker of the four on Kiss Killers. And yet here it's like, wow, that, this is a great dynamic song. I mean, he did, he did. I mean, he did such a good job. I mean, John Karabi is a great singer and, and, you know, he's just got such a cool vibe. And I think that that kind of shows on that song. And I think that has a lot to do with it. 
Yeah, well, John, John is cool personified. Uh, yeah. Karabi, not Jeffrey, uh, though you're pretty cool too, John. <laughs> um, yeah, Kiss This, you get two songs on the album. You get, obviously, the lead-off video single, Calling Dr. Love, and Making Love, which David mixed. What? How tough it is, how, more, let me rephrase it. How tough is it for you as a tribute band to select the songs that you're going to do on a tribute album when you're bringing in a lot of other collaborators to be a part of it? Um, is there any kind of a territorial, of, uh, you know, we're going to do this? Or is it, no, oh, we'll just do this? No, you, you know, really, it was um, for this record, it was really concentrating on songs that I felt we played well live because most of the record, the way we recorded it, um, we had the drummer, whoever, if, if it was a drummer that, you know, we were literally th there with in the studio while they were recording, they would be recording to a, a, you know, a click track or listening to the original song, playing to the original song with or without a click track. And um, our drummer for Kiss This, uh, Julius Jambaluka, who plays Eric Carr, um he like some drummers and, and this isn't us he can't play to a click so i knew going into recording those songs that we we're going to do as a band that we we're going to really have to pull it off live full sense of live and and i didn't want to have it be a situation where we recorded the song live without a click and then have everything get pulled to a click track because as uh david and i were talking about it's very easy once you do that that you can kind of really like suck the life and energy and the groove out of a song when when you take a song that's played you know free form and then pull it to a click track so that was important to me that there are two songs that we could do that we could play live without a click and i wanted to to be two songs that I thought we played really well live. And so that's what led me to pick those two songs. And of course, you know, I wanted to have one song being a, a Paul Stanley song and another song being a Gene Simmons song um, to show that, you know, both of our, you know, main guys in my band, you know, Kevin Blakita, who does Paul Stanley and Taylor Sturza, who does Gene Simmons. Um, you know, I wanted them to both be showcased. And um, as far as the way we did the songs, though, you know, as, as much as it's important to have the deep cuts, you kind of feel the necessity to throw in a handful of the casual songs. But even doing those, I wanted to do them in a different way. So what I wanted to do is, is essentially with both of those songs, we did basically the Kiss Alive 2 arrangements, but we did all the layering like the studio records. Like we did the background vocals with all the, you know, the deep Dr. Love and, you know, the really uh, high girly harmonies and the cool, you know, guitar overdubs. We did everything like the rock and roll over versions, especially with making love with the acoustic guitar and the harmony guitars in the, in the second B section, you know, that was really important to me that if we were going to do two songs that were, you know, more of uh, you know, like I said, for the casual listener, and we at least did them in a way that wasn't just, you know, Oh, this is done just like rock and roll over. Or this is done like a live too. So we did like an amalgamation of, the two versions together for for both songs now you mentioned acoustic guitar and that's something that does jump out at me uh particularly got love for sale you really get to kiss and many bands have complemented their sound by layering acoustic guitar with electric guitars and often you don't get to hear it you just get to hear that one kind of sound that is from the two combined but on have love Will travel got love for sale you actually get to hear some of that coming through i i just found it really tasty it was just a very nice element to hear those sorts of embellishments being made a little bit more obvious on the album you know uh david you didn't mix that one i don't think uh but no. john was that something that you kind of wanted to throw in there these other elements that are often buried that you're not I aware did. of and there's another guy who is like, I would literally have to say one of the MVPs of this record is a guy named Dave Comer. And uh, Dave Comer is actually from a band um, from L.A. called Kill Set. 
and their claim to fame is they did a uh, kind of a parody video of uh, the Criss Cross song Jump. They kind of did like a almost like a Limp Biscuit kind of version of the song. But uh, David, and the funny thing is, is David's like signature guitar in the band is the uh, Ovation Breadwinner which as the KISS fans know out there, that was Ace's first kind of signature guitar that he used in the band. And probably most people don't even know what that guitar is unless they're a KISS fan. So that was Dave's signature, signature guitar and kill set. And not only is he a great guitar player, but even more so, he's a fantastic singer. And he initially came in just to do the song I. And then as we started picking more songs... He was very enthusiastic about wanting to sing more. So then, you know, we had him on, you know, we again, we did a, an amalgamation of the original Gene Simmons demo of Have Love Will Travel with the Kiss version, Got Love for Sale. And when we did that, we were able to incorporate both solos, um, the Ace Freely guitar solo I played, and then the original demo Eddie solo was played by Gene Schmidt, who, you know, Gene's an amazing guitar player, and he played a bunch on the first record, and he played eight songs on this record, and uh, Gene is a huge Eddie Van Halen fan, and he just did a great job, you know, nailing that solo, but truthfully, it was Dave, who's a huge Kiss fan, and he was even calling me out and I, I hold myself pretty much, you know, regard of being, you know, a kiss tard myself. Um, but David was really like saying, hey, you know, you do this song, you have to have this. And one of the things that he was saying you have to have is you have to have the acoustic guitars and they have to be prominent in the mix. So that goes to Dave Comer with that song and also making love, making sure that the acoustics were really, you know, there and in the mix for both of those songs. So, yeah. So, so got to give it up for Dave Comer for, for those aspects. David, you've got a piece of another song. That's one of my favorites on this album and it is an unusual one to include on a kiss tribute. Shoot you full of love. The Vinnie <laughs> Vincent invasion. Um, yeah. I, I'm sorry, but that, that one just reminded me a lot of the Mark Slaughter vocal demo that does circulate out there because he did recut the, the vocal uh, from Robert Fleischman. So it's, it's got the nice element of his singing uh, coming through. Tell me about that one. Uh, that one, um, that was a fun one to mix. That's actually is it Matt Peace who sang on that one. I thought he did a great job. Um, the only problem with mixing that is you, you got to play it over and over again. And after about six hours of those, uh, of those lyrics, my wife had kind of had it, you know, she just was like the first, the first hour, she's like, what the hell are you listening to? I go, no, I'm mixing a song. And you know, she's, she's 10 years younger. So she doesn't really get the Vinnie Vincent thing and, you know, and the Vinnie Vincent invasion stuff. And I, I, I love Robert on that first record. I just think he's great. So, and I think, I think Nat kind of has that kind of Robert Fleischman kind of vibe to his vocals. And just like you had pointed out. So I, I thought it was great, but uh, you know, that one was just a, I mean, he's a good singer. So again, another one that was pretty easy to mix in the guitars on that. Um, I can't remember offhand who did the guitars on that one. Is that Gene, Gene Schmidt? Did. Yeah. That, that's got to be Gene. I was going to say that, yeah, that, is, Gene, that just reeks of Gene. Yeah. And Gene is like, it was funny. We were, we were at the, the release party for this and I hadn't seen Gene since I was like a kid. And because, you know, we both grew up in Buffalo and I hadn't seen him in a number of years. And I said to him, I go, you sat down and learned all that Vinnie Vincent stuff. Like it's like a million notes. And he's like, you know, I just I wanted it to sound right. And and man, I mean, he just did a great job on it. He nailed it. Totally yeah. nailed it. I, I was just I, flabbergasted listening. I mean, yeah. it was tough because the vocals are fantastic and the guitar work is just impeccable. Yeah, he's great. And, you know, I got to hand it to him because I. I I can play pretty fast also. I, there's no way I could play that, you know, that, that, or even learn that kind of stuff. I, I get the, the essence of it, but he just kind of nailed it. And that's, oh, the, you know, the tone it, and the phrasing is just bang on. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, totally. it's really good. And that's tough to do to, yeah. to really hit it. That's, that's a home run, but another one I think is a home run. And again, you've got part of this is Steve Blaze. Um, you love me to hate you. 
which is one of the songs I really dug because back then I liked Joan Jett and I heard, you know, some of the songs that Desmond Child was writing with her, which were kind of, I think this was similar uh, to that, but yeah. it's in a lower key than Paul Stanley. And that makes the song much more palatable. And it, again, it's underneath that is a great song. So tell us a little bit about Steve Blaze and You Love Me to Hate You. Again, that was that was another one where Steve did some really cool guitar things, like some overdubs and some like picking stuff. So the goal with that mix was twofold. One is the, the vocals are lower, so it was a little tougher in the verses to make them stand out. But to your point, when the vocals were lower on that, it gives a, a little bit of a darker, kind of more like ominous kind of vibe to it, which I liked. And then the key was to try to bring out Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of tracks from Steve, but like we had enough to work with and, and they were just well done. So for me, it was trying to bring the, you know, the kind of the little overdubs and like the lead stuff and the things that he did, bringing that out so you could kind of hear it. Yeah, again, I, I think the reason why I'm talking about the music so much here is because I think when people give this a chance, they're really going to find new elements of the KISS recordings to appreciate as much as the covers of those recordings, which is really, you know, one of the the bonuses that you get out of tribute albums rather than just being, um, you know, tributes. John, you've got the Creatures box set behind, behind you there. Yes, was that a reference for Saint and Sinner? Because all those work tapes that you can now hear and you actually get to hear a lot more power because it comes across in Saint and Sinner. You know, it, I, I would love to say yes, but it, it's a complete coincidence. <laughs> those, the, that was actually um, Saint and Sinner and Exciter were two of the songs that um, we had picked at, at the very beginning uh, process of, you know, you know, thinking about songs that we wanted to do and again this was before i even started going into you know having some sort of uh you know uh i guess formula behind what songs were going to be on there i just was like those exciter and satan center were two songs that i really wanted to to record and um and it just happened to be that um you know do driver wound up uh you know doing uh satan center and and uh those guys are really big fans of, you know, uh, I guess, I guess you'd say mashups, you know, where you, you take two songs and kind of segue them together. And they did it on the first album when they recorded jungle, they incorporated, I walk alone into the end of the song. And so I didn't know they were going to do that when they recorded Saint and sinner, but they incorporated another song into the end of, uh, you know, into the end of Satan Center, and uh, that came out cool because they they really did it seamlessly, where they came out of Satan Center, went into another song, and then back into Satan Center and, and finished the track. So, just like was, a bonus. I, I, I again, all those little elements. There's a couple more songs. I don't want to go through every single song because I think people should experience this for themselves um, and and check it out and support the project. Um, Hell or high water. Who is that vocalist? Because I get Doro vibes. You know. Uh, again, it's a song that's being translated from an over-polished um, recording in 1987. You're taking some of that polish off and proving that underneath all that shine was a damn good song. And wow, the vocalist, she's just absolutely fabulous. Yeah, uh, that was sung by my friend Debbie Knight. Uh, she did a, I think she did a great job. Um, you know, again, you know, going back to like, you love me to hate you. Um, that was a song where I thought, you know, Paul sang really, really safe and really, really clean. And I thought hearing that song with a female vocal, it would do more justice to the song because it just seemed to have more of that type of element, you know, in the way that the song was written. And and just to go back to You Love Me to Hate You for a second, um, when when David and I were working together on that song, one of the things that he wanted to do with that song is he wanted to have it so the song actually 
different from the way the kiss version is the kiss version is kind of in a sense one dimensional the way it, it kind of plays through but david wanted to take the song and literally have it start to build so like during the verses the guitars were a little bit lower and then as you got to the pre-chorus and then in the chorus you know when it's really the vocals are really just hitting you so were the guitars so that was all you know david julian you know his idea to do that which which was great and uh again you know um with hell or high water again that was a song where i thought gene you know utilized some of his his cleaner vocal techniques you know which which is fine but at the same time i i don't necessarily think that that's the best you know gene simmons vocal in the world and i thought instead of you know having somebody you know male come in and and, and try to you know sing super clean i thought it'd be kind of cool to have a female come in and give her interpretation and sing it with a little more grit and and i think it worked out well yeah gritty female vocals or cookie monster vocals give me the gritty female it, it brings a nice it's a nice change of you know kind of palette uh, during the album oh we've talked about drummers we've talked about guitars we've talked uh, about vocalists i think we better not forget about the bassists and it's a kind of a toss-up here between Phil Schaus and Billy Sheehan, which Billy Sheehan's going to win. So uh, Love for Sale, which is, is, of course, it was released on, I think, one of the Mark St. John EPs back in the day that I think he did with Phil Narrow. Uh, why Love for Sale? What, what was it about that song that brought it into the mix for this album? Well, unfortunately, the reason that that song wound up on the record was because of Phil Narrow's passing. Um, Phil and I were speaking um right around the time this must have been about late march that he was just starting to recover from he had throat cancer and after he had gone through chemo and everything he hadn't been singing he was he wasn't even really talking um but he just started singing again and i started talking to him about him participating on the record because not only is phil you know a great sit well he he was a, a great singer um you know and and he had the you know the buffalo connection with uh you know singing for for talus and um i really wanted to have him be on the record and unfortunately uh his passing was very very sudden it seemed like that he had beat the cancer and he was on his way to recovery and then word came out that uh he had he had passed away um so i thought it would be a nice tribute if i could get the remaining members of the talus version two to you know participate and do something in tribute to phil and you know obviously being that this was a kiss tribute record i wanted to have something kiss related and uh phil narrow co-wrote the song love for sale with peter chris so i thought it'd be cool to have the talus guys record it and then ironically even though jeff scott soto was in a band with billy sheehan at the time the sons of apollo um it was dean castronovo who when phil narrow passed away i was talking to dean and I told Dean that, you know, that Phil had passed away and I was trying to, you know, you know, try kind of, you know, fill the, the spot, uh, so to speak, no pun intended. Um, and uh, I asked Dean, you know, if, if he could get any other, you know, name people to be on the record. And, and he came through for me. He got Jeff Scott Soto. He got John Karabi and he got Johnny Gioelli from Hardline. Um, and, and again, those three guys weren't even people on my wish list. He, you know, Dean just happened to be friends with all three of them and he reached out to them and they all agreed to be part of the record. So uh, it just made sense to have Jeff Scott Soto sing and, and kind of, you know, fill in for Phil and do the vocals, you know, with the remaining members of uh, Talus version two. So that's, that's how that, that song came about and ironically um david julian he he has had a relationship with phil too that kind of led to um some of his success with working with frontiers yeah so uh, about a year and a half or two years before phil's passing 
um, I was doing like a lot of country guitar session work, like country, and I'm not really a country guy. Um, I hadn't been doing a lot of rock stuff. And I, I went to see a show and Phil was opening up acoustic. I, I can't even remember now who I went to see. It escapes me, but Phil was the opener. Um, I think it was actually Kip Winger was doing an acoustic set in Buffalo and Phil was the opener and I was just blown away by his voice. And I'm like, the last time I saw him was when I was a kid and they opened for Iron Maiden in Buffalo, Talis did. And I said, you know, I, I really want to get back into doing like more rock stuff. And I actually, some of the songs that I wrote um, with Phil in mind, we, we started, he actually came over to my house. We worked a little bit together and then I really didn't hear from him after we had worked together a few times didn't really know what happened. And then I later found out that he was sick. But at the time, a couple of the songs that I was going to present to him or that I think maybe one of them I did and he didn't like it, I ended up sending those to Frontiers. And then I was very fortunate that Alessandro at Frontiers was nice enough to listen to him. And then they ended up using him for a project that's coming out, uh, I think, next year. So that's kind of how I got my start with Frontiers was really through Phil Nero because I really started doing a rock music again. It was inspired by Phil and seeing him live. Yeah, Phil Nero was an incredible classy guy. He was a, a very supportive as me as a young online Kiss geek uh, back at the beginning of my time doing what I do. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Who was very willing to answer questions. And in my mailbox one day showed up a 8 by 10 of him with Mark St. John. Um, Oh, wow. you know, on, on acoustics. So uh, cool. again, a, a very open and incredibly talented person as well. I, I do oh, yeah. like that lineup that Chris had with him on lead vocals and the songs, you know, that they wrote together um, are, are just, it's, it's great to see one featured here. Um, last song I think I'll ask about John is Mitch Weissman has um, revisited one of Gene Simmons. I hate to say scraps, but they are forgotten songs. They are songs that get left on the cutting room floor, and we only get to hear them in overly generated copies, you know, in the 80s and 90s, mainly the 90s, I guess, in the cassette days. Um, what you see is what you get has been given new life for this project. Um, how did, well, obviously Mitch was involved in the first one, but how did this song come to life on the project? Well, I mean, obviously, me being a collector like yourself, Julian, you know. You're that, still in my address book that I got from like <laughs> 1997 in, when I was in England. That's awesome. Um, as you know, that song had circulated a long time um, on various cassettes and later, you know, CDRs as being an asylum demo. And that was one of the songs, you know, that was uh, – put on a cassette originally along with a bunch of songs that were sung by Gene Simmons, some that made asylum, some didn't. And um, I was always curious who sang that song. And then listening to the chorus of the song, I thought that the chorus really, really had that strong kiss sound. And that was obviously the combination of Gene Simmons harmony with Mitch Wiseman, who I later found out was the singer on that song. So I had talked to Mitch, you know, we, uh, Mitch and I kept in touch after we had did the first Wolf Rock City record. And we were talking about other ideas that we could do other, you know, kiss related things that, that we could kind of revive that he was part of. And when I was talking to Mitch about that song, he actually told me that even though that was being circulated as an asylum demo, that was actually something that was demoed for Crazy Nights um, because he, he re distinctly remembered that being the Ron Nevison album. And one of the interesting things was is that Ron was really pushing both Gene and Paul to come up with a Foreigner, Foreigner the band type sounding songs. And as a lot of fans have pointed out, Reason to Live as kind of a similar chorus to I Want to Know What Love Is by Foreigner. And the funny thing was, is that Mitch told me the intro for what you see is what you get, that Ron wanted them to come up with an intro that was Foreigner sounding. So originally 
you know, it, it, they were trying to come up with something that's, that, that was like, feels like the first time. So when we started, you know, kind of taking the song and, and kind of deconstructing it and putting it back together, uh, Gene Schmidt and I were working together on the song with the Easy Drummer program, just trying to figure out what kind of drums would work because on the original demo, what they used was a, a loop of Eric Carr's drums from Lick It Up. So like there was literally just like, you know, the straight beat of Lick It Up on a loop for the whole song. And there really wasn't any kind of, you know, fills or any kind of, you know, builds or anything. It was just kind of, you know, straight across drumming. So what we wanted to do in, in the beginning was after I talked to Mitch and he told me what their idea was, is we actually came up with the intro first and we originally came up with a keyboard part for the beginning of uh, what you see is what you get like feels like the first time but it just it sounded too pretty it made the song sound way too uh like i said too too soft we wanted to keep kind of the grit of the song and so we scrapped the keyboard part but we kept the intro the way that it is on buffalo rock city too and that's kind of the way that we built the song and on the original demo there's really only a couple parts you basically have the main riff pre-chorus chorus and that's it so i wanted to add some more parts to the song so we incorporated um you know uh, instrumental part uh, a breakdown uh you know after the solo there's like a finger picking guitar part and then at the end um again they were kind of going with a, a lick it up kind of vibe i came up with the idea to have kind of like a, a call and response vocal like Gene and Paul did on the song, Lick It Up, and two of the guys who sang on the record, again, Dave Comer and uh, Jody Valletta from Do Driver, I had them kind of do that similar Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley call and response thing, like on the breakdown of Lick It Up, and we incorporated that into the song. And um, I really think that we gave that song new life, and, and I hope KISS fans appreciate being able to hear a more complete version of that song because, again, I feel that, that the core of the song was really the chorus, and it had a really cool KISS vibe, and I wanted to kind of give the rest of that song the same kind of vibe and the same kind of life, and I just hope you know fans appreciate it. I think they will. I think it's it's very well done, and you're absolutely right about the chorus. Before we wrap up here, I do want to uh, just say – that I think people will enjoy the intro to this album very much. Um, I'm not going to say anything other than that about it. Um, I also, but I do want to ask about the artwork. Who um, Who's created this stunning, vivid, color, um, colorful artwork for you? Kevin Conrad. Kevin Conrad is a very good friend of mine. He did the um, album artwork for the first Buffalo Rock City record and um it only made sense to bring kevin back and if people aren't familiar with his name um he did all of the psycho circus uh mcfarland comics all 31 issues he he inked all of those and um he worked with todd on the spawn comics and he's a super talented artist and um i was just very grateful that he was um willing to come back and do you know the artwork for the for the you know for the second uh studio record john before i let you wrap things up with uh, where people can find you um david if people want to find you or you want people to find them where can people find you and what do you have coming up professionally in your life that um that you can talk about um <clears throat> as far as where to find me i'm on uh, instagram under at mono composer m-o-n-o -O, composer um as far as stuff I'm working on, I, I've got some projects coming up for film and TV. And then obviously the big thing is the uh, the co-write with Steve Brown and Ace for Ace's new record that's coming out, you know, and we'll get into that, you know, uh, when that comes out. But um, those are kind of the biggest things right now. But I'm always writing rock stuff um, and always, you know, you know, looking for new projects to do from a rock standpoint. So that's really going to be my focus going forward. Very cool. Well, it was very nice meeting you today, and thank you for you know taking us a little bit behind the console into how mixing takes place and what goes into it. John, where can people find you, and where more importantly, where can people find um, Buffalo Rock City too? 
Um, people can uh, hit me up right on my band site. It's uh, Kiss This WNY on Facebook, and they can reach out to me or anybody in the band. Or if they want to go to the, um, we have a Facebook page for Buffalo Rock City, and then we also have the website for Buffalo Rock City, which is very easy. It's buffalorockcity.com, and you go to the website and it takes you right to um it'll redirect you to Bandcamp and you can purchase you know Buffalo Rock City 2 either on CD or if that's uh you know antiquated you can get it on a USB drive you can plug it into your car or your computer whatever you want very cool you dropped a new video today didn't you I did I did um we actually um it was it was funny because um Dean back when he was with the dead daisies he used to do this uh car karaoke thing and he originally did it um sing along to love gun and you know dean has been super super busy ever since he rejoined journey but i thought that his track that he did where he sang and he played drums and we brought in uh paul stanley's guitar player from you know, he did the Live to Win tour, and he's also on Soul Station. Rafael Moreira was actually where he's from. In Brazil, you don't pronounce the R, so it's actually Rafael. So they call him Hafa for short. So just in case people wonder what, where the nickname comes from. Um, I just, you know, really wanted to have people to be able to hear the song and obviously you know put something interesting to it so we used the just kind of video montage Dean, dean's old car karaoke footage and then um when hoffa recorded his solo for love gun he was asking me like what i wanted him to do which i thought was kind of interesting because most of the guys especially the national guys when they record their parts i just kind of let them do whatever they want you know i feel like you know, with their name recognition, they kind of earn their own artistic license to to either sing the way that they sing or play however they play. So nobody ever asked me before, you know, what I wanted them to play. And I said, well, it would be kind of cool if you went back and you played the solo like you did on the uh, One Live Kiss DVD. Ooh. So he went back and he relearned the solo. And so it was funny. He replicated it so well that we are able to sync up his guitar solo from the One Live Kiss DVD to the solo that he played on Love Gun, and that's in the video. And uh, initially, we just put it out on Facebook because it's, like I said, it's not, we don't own any of the footage. It, it was just something that, the footage that was already circulating, and we thought it'd be kind of a cool background to uh, sync the uh, audio to so people could get a taste of the song because for me, it's one of my favorite tracks on the record. I love Dean and I love Hoffa. I think they're both amazing. And, um, you know, so we decided that we'd put that out today just to uh, reach people beyond Facebook. So now it's on YouTube. Very cool. All right. I'm, I'm fully behind this album. I can strongly recommend it. I think you'll get as much of a kick out of it as I did and finding all those little nuances, some of which have been detailed today. Um, I think they'll give you hours of fun. You'll be listening to it repeatedly and just finding new things jumping out at you from the audio. Um, but I guess for now, from myself, David Julian, John Jeffrey, thank you very much for taking the time to join us and to tell us all about Buffalo Rock City Volume 2. And I just want to add one last thing. You speaking of hours of fun, I just want to give a special shout out to Joe Teresi. Um, Joe, he's been a longtime member of the KISS FAQ, and he was literally my right-hand man, my head engineer on this record, and he spent hours and hours and hours of his time taking in all the tracks that we had sent to us from all different locations, all different studios around the world, and really meticulously going through everything, making sure that there were no errors, no clicks, no pops, nothing, and everything lined up perfectly before, you know, everything got sent off to be mixed to David. Um, he did a lot of work, you know, working directly with David too. So I just, you know, even though he's... He, <laughs> only an engineer it, it it really doesn't do justice to the amount of work that he did 
on this record. And I just wanted to make that mention because he really worked hard on this record and, and he deserves a, a lot, uh, a lot of kudos for everything that he did. Nicely said. And thank you to everyone who's been a part of making this musical magic. It's been a really enjoyable journey. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank All you. Right, Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final, there are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.